This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. Are you an influencer? Do you know what an influencer even means? Well, you are in luck. We've got Cloris Kylie, author of the amazing book, Beyond Influencer Marketing. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, David. It's awesome to be here. So you have written a fantastic book called Beyond Influencer Marketing, and this is your business. This is where you help people and coach and consult in this area. How did this become your thing. Give us a little quick sketch of your professional journey that brought you to your current expertise. Yeah. Well, you know, at the beginning when I started my business online, I had had an offline business for a while, helping students, college and high school students. When I brought it online, I thought I would just create programs. I had a book out. It was a personal development book. I said, oh, the book is great. People will just find it. It's going to be fantastic. Of course, I wasn't for a rude awakening, right? And at first, I wanted to do it all myself. So I said, okay, it looks like I have to have a blog. So I'll have a blog and I'll write every day. I'm just going to work really hard. I had a radio show. It was a live radio show. So I would just consume all these books, personal development books, and I would just have a monologue about them and my thoughts and so forth. And I wasn't making any progress. Like I still had the same 30 listeners after six months, same people, you know, my mom, one of them. And (laughs) I said, okay, something has to change. And in that search, okay, what are other people doing? I just started to notice that there was a lot of collaboration going on. You know, people were guests on other people's podcasts and there were guest posts and it was a new concept for me. But that's when like, I finally got this aha moment and said, why am I not collaborating with other people? Why am I not sharing my message on an existing audience rather than trying to build this audience from scratch that is going to take me years? So that's when I started to bring guests to my radio show. Those guests introduced me to influencers who then had me on their shows. And I started to make fast progress. I published articles on Tiny Buddha. That was the first uh, large blog I published. And even now, it's been, I don't know, six years or more. I still get emails from people who read my articles that I wrote those years ago saying, thank you. So it's incredible. Things really changed for me. And when it was time for me to write a book, I said, okay, what is it that I've done that really changed my life and my business? collaborating with influencers. So that's why I now I'm passionate about this and I want to uh, just show it to everyone. So much richness to what you just said. And I think the thing that we want to go back to just for a quick moment is I thought I could do it myself, Mm -hmm. right? The lone wolf, the lone wolf syndrome. Hey, Mm -hmm. I'm an entrepreneur. I've got that independent spirit. I don't need help. I don't need other people. I'm just going to do this on my own because doesn't everyone do this on their own? Now, I think I know the answer, but as you have become an influencer and as you've coached and helped hundreds of other people both connect with influencers and become influencers themselves, does anyone ever do this alone? Really? When you look at it? Never. If you want to do it alone, you'll be in for a pretty tough road. And uh, it'll be very difficult to survive. I mean, I'm thinking in our, you know, always changing times, so many challenges that the whole world is going through. The one thing that will always stay strong and present in a business is relationships and collaboration. So uh, even now more than ever, it's, it's important to do that. And the book has so many great lists, insights, instructions, approaches. Talk about why this is actually the fast path. People go, oh, it takes a lot of time to build these relationships. And I don't have that kind of time. But one of the mantras I think that you really illustrate brilliantly in the book is that the shortcut is the long way, meaning that you will get quantum leaps in your business by doing this sort of influencer marketing strategy that will put you years and years ahead rather than if you had tried it doing it yourself. What are some of the reasons, and just give us some of the high-level benefits of this influencer marketing strategy that you talk about early on in the book? 
Yeah, but I think one of the most important aspects of this is the trust, right? So people do business with those that like and trust, right? And if you have that part already done for you, why? Because if an influencer says, you know, you just are saying here's Clora, she knows what she's talking about. She has grown her business with influencer marketing. People want to listen because they know you and they know that you will only bring somebody to the show who can bring value, deliver value. So that happens with influencers who feature you. As soon as that influencer introduces you as somebody they trust, the audience trust them more. That's huge. It's about the whole pre-frame, how people get to know about you. That makes a huge difference. Like I've done advertising for my business and it's such a big difference when you put a Facebook ad to cold audience who has never heard about you. The uh, rate of unsubscribes is huge. A lot of people just want to grab your lead magnet and they leave. You know, it takes a long time to really warm that lead or that person, that relationship until they finally I want to work with you. But if you have that trust factor there, I think that's the biggest advantage of doing this. But not just that, it's like if you already have an audience that is made of ideal clients are just ready for you, isn't that much better than just trying to find people here and there uh, so to join your own list or your own social media platform? It's an audience already there for you and and you know their problems, you know what they resonate with so you can serve them much better. Absolutely. Now, let's just define, because I think this term influencer Mm -hmm. has been used, abused, turned inside out, turned upside down. People might think an influencer is a celebrity Mm -hmm. or a movie star or a pop star. An influencer is someone that has a zillion Instagram followers, you know, fashion blogger, food blogger, things like this. When we're talking about speakers, consultants, coaches, experts, business book authors, people, Cloris, like you and me, you've got some really great criteria in the book about how to select the right kind of influencer to start to build a relationship with. And what are some of those criteria that we should be thinking about where we don't get distracted, we don't get sidetracked into someone that has a zillion followers and, oh, that's going to be my person, or we don't set unrealistic expectations like, oh, I'm going to get Tony Robbins to promote my new program and that'll just take about 10 minutes. And that's not how it works. And you talk about that in the book, but walk us through some of the baby steps. Number one, what's your definition of an influencer? And then number two, based on who we are and our business and our target market, how do we pick the right kinds of influencers to start with? Yes. Yeah, it's so important because if you have the wrong idea of what an influencer is, you will never even start. You'll say, that's not for me, right? So I want you to look at an influencer as somebody who um, already has an audience of people who trust that person. And that audience could be of millions or it could be of hundreds. And that's okay, as long as there's a captive audience. So yes, you could collaborate with let's say if you're a coach or consultant with another coach or consultant who has a group program and they bring you as a special guest to speak to that group of clients, right? Or it could be somebody who has a really thriving Facebook group and they bring you as a guest to speak on Facebook Live for that group. So again, it could be anybody who has a captive audience uh, of perfect clients for you. So I guess the first step is to figure out, uh, number one, does that person have my uh, ideal audience? And uh, do they resonate with uh, my values and style? How do you figure that out? Well, you get to know the influencer. It's not about reaching out to a million people. It's about reaching out to a small group of people who become supporters and allies. So if you go to their website and you read about them, the About Me page, you go to the Facebook profile, to LinkedIn, see the types of things they write about themselves, their stories, you know, check out their social media posts. If they have a podcast and listen to it and see what the message is and ask yourself, is there a match? Because if the style of that influencer clashes with yours, even if the ideal audience is there, that audience will not like you, you know? So you're looking for people who who you can resonate with. I was recently just an hour ago talking to a client and she said, I had her do um, a research on different podcasts to be on. And I told her, you know, you can listen to part of the episode and then see what you like the most. And then she said, well, some of the episodes were so great that I just found myself listening to the entire thing. And I said, that's the influencer you want to connect with. It's perfect, see, because you really resonated with their message. And then of course, make sure 
that first of all, you have what it takes to get results out of this. I know this is not so much related to uh, selecting the right influencers, but you got to be ready so that when that influencer features you, you get results in the form of new subscribers or clients. And it doesn't just become something that, okay, you did, you put it on your website, you had a little bit of you know publicity and that's it. So it really needs to have a little bit of a strategy behind it about yes. I'm on the show. What am I talking about? And again, this is all laid out step by step. One of the things I love about your book, and there's actually two great things I love about your book in addition to all the smaller things. When you put in Beyond Influencer Marketing, the steps, the suggestions, right? Reply to their emails if you're a subscriber, like their content, share their content. And there's dozens and dozens of more strategies to initially get on their radar, Yes. right? Soft touch, but just show up in their world like a happy squeaky wheel that you're always sharing, you're promoting, you are being of value and you are magnifying and amplifying what they're saying to help them, right? right? So I love the steps. The other thing I love is that your book, very similar to my books, you have collaborators. You have basically guest posts or guest columns in your book. And you've got about a dozen or so. I've got about 13, 14 in the Do It Marketing book and another 13 or 14 in the Do It Speaking book. I'm a total believer. So you and I are totally in congruence about put other people even into your book, right? Feature and leverage other people because when you build their platform, they will be much more likely to help you build your platform. So I'm curious, where did you get the idea to bring these other authors and these other people into your book to contribute these sort of success sidebars into your book, Beyond Influencer Marketing? Where did that idea come from? And then what did some of those relationships evolve into? Yeah, Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I would say I, when I was creating the book, I said, okay, this is my experience, but people are going to say, oh, that's just her, right? She did it. I don't know how, if it will work for me or not. I thought the best way to do this was to prove that it has worked for so many other influencers. So having people write their own stories and include them in the book, I thought it was essential. But also anything I do now, any platform, any event I create, any marketing piece, I want it to be a collaborative piece. So I recently did a a virtual summit, collaborated with people, feature them, same thing with the book, with my podcast. You know, everything I do, I try to bring that element of collaboration. So if you, as a coach, speaker, author, uh, if you have a platform of your own, I encourage you to think about what could I do to make that a way for me to deliver value to an influencer, to feature them so I can start that relationship with them. Because there's nothing better than you inviting an influencer to be guests on your platform to really grow that connection, right? You're not asking for anything, you're giving by having them as as guests on your platform. Yeah, I think as I'm reading through all these great detailed strategies in the book, and and you also, you address this, but I I want you to talk about it. I'm reading this, I may be new to the business, maybe I just left my corporate gig, I don't have a big list, I don't have a big platform, or I've been sort of under the radar as a consultant, coach, speaker, and I really have not made a big public splash about my visibility, I'm going to get some imposter syndrome. I'm going to get, oh boy, you know, who would want to talk to me and what value could I possibly add? And why in the world would they have me on their show? They have these other rock stars and other people on the show. And you talk about it brilliantly in the book, but let's unpack that right now. Because as people are listening, they're going, yeah, boy, that would be great. But I got nothing. I mean, I've got a tiny list. I have a niche business. I'm not really out there that much. Why would anyone pay attention to me or have me on their show or have me guest blog on their blog? What's your answer to that? Well, I would say is is to become aware of the value that you already have. Many times we forget about it. It becomes a second nature, our expertise, the connections we currently have. That's great value, our ideas even. I always talk about James Altucher, who he just started to send ideas to corporations. This is what I think you could do to do things better. And he ended up going to Amazon headquarters, invited by their top executives just to share his ideas, just because he decided to send his ideas, right? So 
don't discount that, you know, your ideas, your expertise that you can deliver to a, an audience through a podcast, a YouTube channel. That's huge. That's what people want as a content creator. You know, you're one of them, David, I am. I want high quality content. And if somebody, there's somebody out there who has great content, who cares about my platform, my audience, and is willing to share that, I'd be happy to feature them, right? So it's a matter of saying, okay, this is what I have to offer. This is my expertise. I could potentially connect the influencer to someone else. And remember, this influencer doesn't have to reach a million people. They have to be people who, even if their audience is smaller, you guys have a lot in common, a similar audience, uh, so you can collaborate. And once you get those first interviews, those first collaborations, right, then you can move up to larger and larger platforms until you're featured in front of millions, right? But it's, again, as you said, it's baby steps. Just get your feet wet, get things going, become a great interviewee, and then you'll see how just things just start rolling, just this huge positive momentum evolves. Now, I know that you probably talk about this with some of your coaching and consulting clients, and I think it's important where these strategies are evergreen, they're always going to work, and if you implement what Chloris teaches, they're going to work even better. Right now, we're in the middle of this COVID-19 coronavirus craziness. A lot of clients, a lot of experts are frozen, right? They're paralyzed with fear, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of doubt, turbulence, et cetera, that's floating around out there. Would you say this is a good time, a bad time, or the perfect time? to start getting into influencer marketing and break through some of the noise and some of the paralysis? Definitely the perfect time because now is when you can nurture those connections, right? Now you can build that trust. You can strengthen current relationships. I think right now is a time to build and nurture relationships so that when this is over, and it will be at some point, then you're all ready to work together and to share your message in a grander way. At the same time, you could talk about and, and share your expertise right now. It doesn't have to be like you're just building and, and nurturing connections. And then in the future, when things are uh, back to normal, then you'll share your expertise. You can do it right now because people are thirsty for hope. They're thirsty for knowledge about what to do. And if you are somebody who can bring them a new perspective, and to really help them prepare in the best possible way to survive and thrive in business or whatever you know aspect of their life they want to improve, then I feel like it's, it's your duty to do that you know, right away and to share, as I always say, reveal your magnificence with the world. Hey, good looking. Are you currently getting paid to speak? Would you like to ramp that up? We can help. Book a confidential speaker strategy call with our team at doitmarketing.com slash call, and let's see what we might do together. The call is free, but the results may be priceless. I want to go behind the curtain a little bit into yeah. your business. Okay. So you started, you said you started this about six, seven years ago? That's right. With the current topic focus. And did you start out? coaching one-on-one? -on -one? Did you start out with a course? And then and now, of course, I'd love you to walk through sort of your whole business model and all of your different ways that you serve people, one-on-one, -on -one, group, mastermind, course, book, all these different things. And just show the evolution of how some of those things evolved in your business. Yes, David. I, I tried a few things. As I said at the beginning, I was trying to do it all on my own, right. including not having the right mentors to guide me. So I will skip through that part. All I'm going to say, never launch, <laughs> never launch a program without doing beta testing. A big mistake I made, uh, wasted uh, six months of hard work. Meaning um, that you, you created something that nobody wanted to buy. That's right. Exactly. Oh. It took me six months till it was a lot of work. I didn't know, right? So now you know, don't make the same mistakes. And once I learned how to do this right, I started to first see one-on-one -on -one clients and then document my system, right? Because once you work with a client one-on-one, -on -one, you start seeing where you know the bottlenecks are, exactly what it is that they need, things you need to add to make your system more and more effective. So once I have that entire system documented, then I was ready to create. I have digital programs that I sell. I have a group coaching program, a mastermind. So all of these offers have come out of that. 
So I would say definitely start with, you know, one-on-one, make sure that your system is solid, that delivers results that is as standardized as possible, and then you can go and evolve and create courses and programs. That's the engineer coming out, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. I'm very organized all about systems. Uh, right. <laughs> so one-on-one, and then you still do some one-on-one today. That's for right. folks that want that. And then tell us about what some of the scaling strategies are that you've used to, number one, help more people, yeah. and then also to add some scalable revenue to your business. Yes. Well, I have a group coaching program. And uh, the advantage of this program is that, you know, people love the group dynamics. So I just walk them through the process to strengthen their foundation so they actually get results when they connect with the influencers. And then to go through the process of selecting the right influencers, the sending out pitches and requests, having those conversations, and then taking that relationship to the next level, right? So everybody goes through the same process. And, uh, you know, it's great. You know, people encourage each other. I love the group dynamics. Now, at the same time, I'm with the group, right? So I'm there. It it still requires my time. Uh, So I've developed uh, digital training that is just, you know, people do it at, at their own pace. And this also at a lower price point, so I can serve people who might not be able to afford my one-on-one programs or even the group program. So I developed that. And then um, I also have a mastermind program in which people can support each other and collaborate. So it's not just about uh, learning at this point, but about finding those you know, JV partners and people to collaborate with. Uh, so different aspects of what I focus on, which is, you know, one thing, which is relationships and collaboration. So I would ask yourself, what is that core value that all of your offers will revolve around? And then what is the perfect mix without going overboard? Like, uh, you know, every program you have, you will have to maintain, you will have to update and market. It's not like you're going to create a course, oh, just like I thought, it'll, it'll sell because great product or program. So before you create something new, make sure that you have the bandwidth to market it and to support it as well as you can. Yeah, for sure. One of the things that, frankly, I was surprised to read in the book is that you talk about getting on TV. And man, if I had some imposter syndrome coming into this, now I really have imposter syndrome going, who the heck would want to see me on TV? But you've been on TV a lot. You coach your clients and how to get on TV and then how to use TV as one of those influencer strategies. Is TV still relevant? I mean, now that everything is streaming and online and digital and on demand, what role does TV play? And I'm guessing, I I think I might know the answer. When we get that TV footage, is it really up to us to socialize and spread that and make that a bigger deal than whoever might have seen it on a Friday afternoon at six o'clock at night on the news? Yes, it's definitely social proof. That's the strongest advantage of being on TV. You know, once people see you on a, on a national network, even if it's at a local, you know, uh, sure. news station, it does bring you up in, you know, their eyes of, oh, wow, well, they're, they're really an expert. You know, they're on TV. Right. Yes, you know, you have YouTube, the streaming services, but it, television still has that aura of, oh, wow, you know, she must really know her stuff because they brought it on TV, just like having a book. I think it will never change. The fact that you position yourself as an expert when you have your book out, same applies to television. So don't think, especially in our industry, is not likely to get a lot of clients through television appearances, but you'll be able to use that television appearance to create a media reel for your website, to share it on social media, to build that authority, put it on LinkedIn. So it really elevates your profile to the next level. So I highly recommend it for everyone, though, regardless of your industry, that you try to get at least one spot on television. And there are very, very specific instructions, by the way, for doing that in your coaching program, in your book, in your mentoring You also mentioned something that I just have a little hesitation about, and I've sort of guided clients away from it, but you have a very brilliant strategy that I didn't really even think of about local groups, local groups, chambers, et cetera. My experience has been that that is like a small potatoes, local backyard kind of thing, but you say, hey, don't forget to look in your backyard, right? So talk about what's that backyard strategy 
with the local chambers, networking groups, et cetera? How does that work? Yeah. But I would say in this case, the influencers are the leaders of those groups. And, you know, for example, I've been a, a contributor to the local library for years now. So I would go and, and give a, a workshop to local business owners. But I think that relationship actually took me to new levels because, again, I became a supporter of the librarian. And I told her, you know, I was wondering where else I could speak. And then she introduced me to people who have organizations in the Hartford area for small business owners. And without her, I don't think I would have been able to connect with those organizers and the leaders of those organizations. So I've been able to speak to larger audiences in the Hartford area for business owners, my ideal audience. And uh, a couple of my clients just recently came from an appearance that I did for the Hartford Small Business Association. So it just shows you that even if it's just your local library, that person can connect you to other people in your area so you can have local speaking engagements. Same applies with people who have a meetup group. Of course, you gotta be careful with meetups. Some of them are really, uh, they don't have much engagement. A couple of people show up to meetings. So that's why you have to do your research, right? But if it's a group that is super engaged and you become, again, a supporter of the leader of that group, they might have you as a speaker. They might connect you with other meetup group owners. And then again, there's nothing like being face-to-face, even, in, you know, well, I, hopefully this is all over soon so we can get out there and, and have face-to-face uh, meetings. But there's nothing like being in the same room with somebody to create that rapport and to, you know, sign up your clients. What a great episode. Wowza. Tell you what, if you want to ramp up your revenue as an expert who speaks professionally, you should really check out our free online training at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. Now, let's talk about, there's a section in the book about when influencer marketing goes wrong. And it's not even so much about going wrong, but you know, what happens if they don't respond? What happens if I get ignored? And I think there's also some mistakes that we make like doing the initial approach, being on their podcast or being featured in some way, and then letting the relationship run cold and making it a one-off experience where you sort of disappear into the sunset just the same way that you appeared on their horizon. What are some of the mistakes that you proactively warn your clients about saying, don't do this at the beginning, don't do this in the middle, and for heaven's sakes, don't do this at the end? Well, the most important thing is to remember that this is all about delivering value first or you really put the relationship in jeopardy, right? So I get invitations, I don't know, maybe every day of the week to promote people's programs. These are people I I don't know who they are. They just reach out to me. I was wondering if you promote my new course to your audience, right? So yeah, so those are just examples of people who, who didn't think twice. They have the best intentions. They have probably a good program. I don't know, but I don't know them, right? Or people who want me to be on giveaways. I have never heard of them. Oh, by the way, you have to promote three times to your list and uh, it's $150. It's like, who are you, right? So it's about asking yourself, How can I deliver value first to open the door to the relationship? So if you have a platform such as a podcast, a YouTube channel, even a Facebook group, and you could feature that influencer to that audience, even if you have a very small audience, it's fine. They will appreciate it. Or there are other ways to deliver value. Maybe the person has a book out and you are the supporter of that book. That's actually a quick tip to connect with top influencers is like if they have a new book coming out and you reach out to them, uh, to their team, uh, they're very likely to say yes to be featured on your platform. Like for example, I'll be having uh, Jack Canfield on my show pretty soon and it's because he's promoting a book, right? But if I had reached out to him at another time, probably I wouldn't have heard back. So you gotta be timely and find something of value that matters to them. What is it that they have going on? They have a book out. They have a new podcast out. Are you there posting a review of their show and letting them know, right? So those are ways to deliver value, but you got to pick what matters the most first. So if you send an influencer a link to an article that you have a million emails to go through, that's not value, right? So you got to think about what is the most valuable thing I can do for this influencer and then start the relationship that way. Now, whether it's Jack Canfield, whether it's somebody else, they're going to be on your show. 
You're going to interview them, help them promote their book, help them get to an outcome that they want. How will you follow up or how do you typically recommend that your clients keep that relationship not only warm, but keep it advancing and growing so that at some point in the future, there would be an opportunity or something would emerge where that influencer would be very open to promoting you to their audience, which I think is the ultimate outcome, not just once, but to have an ongoing mutually beneficial relationship that develops where it's truly win-win-win. It's win for you, it's win for the influencer, and it's win for your shared audiences. So how do you keep it warm and how do you keep it growing, that relationship? Yeah, well, here you have to be very selective because let's say uh, as your network expands, you will be featured in front of many, many audiences, right? It's very difficult to have the same level, the same kind of relationship with everyone, the same depth. So it's important that you decide who's going to be in that inner circle, right? I would say no more than 20 people should be in that inner circle, people you're going to be working with for the foreseeable future. So let's say that you had an interview on somebody's show, podcast, and you felt that there was a great connection, that you really believe in their message and you would like to take that relationship to the next level, right? Then you have to ask yourself, what is the next thing I can do for this person? I call it value stacking. So it's just like you're just throwing value on top of value and value and value. And the person's like, wow, they really start to see you as an ally. So that could be immediately, of course, in the thank you note, then post a review of their show, post a recommendation on LinkedIn, ask them what they have going on and support that. If they have a program, maybe you can be a JV partner. If they have a paid program, a paid group, join it and be one of the most active um, members. So yes, it requires time, but you have selected that person to be part of your inner circle. And when it's time for you to, to ask them, would you like to you know, do a JV webinar with me? Uh, they'll say yes, um, because you know, they are your supporters now. They have become somebody you know, who trusts you, who wants to help you succeed. So that's important. That doesn't mean that you're going to abandon the other people, right? Uh, you will still nurture the connection by what I usually, what I have, I have a, just a basic spreadsheet. So I have that inner circle and I have the expanded inner circle. So what I do once a week, I just go over my sheet and see, okay, this person I haven't really talked to in a couple of months. Let me just send a quick hello via email or I'll go to their Facebook page and check their most recent posts. And then if there's something of value there, like something they have going on, something they just launched, I support that, I share it. And uh, that way I'm on the radar, right? They know I'm a supporter. Uh, So it's something that becomes a habit. So you can say every, you know, Tuesday morning from eight to nine, I'm just going to go over my sheet, see who I have to kind of reconnect with and support. That's all it takes. And you'll see how you have that really strong network though. Totally brilliant. And I know that one of the things that you teach your clients is treat this influencer marketing campaign almost like a sales campaign that you need a customer relationship management tool, in your case, your spreadsheet. By the way, I don't believe you that your spreadsheet is simple. I'm sure your spreadsheet does all kinds of things and lights up and colors and sorting and tabs. And I'm guessing that you geek out on this spreadsheet, but it's just a guess. I could be wrong. Am I wrong? (laughs) No, you're not wrong, actually. I'm not wrong. There. (laughs) See that? I knew that. But I love what you're saying about 20 on the A list. And that's flexible, right? That's a living document. So new people would come onto your A-list. And once some relationships run cold, despite your best efforts, maybe people come off that A-list and they go to the outer circle and now they're in the B-list. But I love the fact that just like with a customer relationship management software, you are constantly checking it and saying, well, who haven't I touched lately? Who haven't I helped? Who haven't I checked in with? Who haven't I had just a quick text or Facebook message or quick phone call. Hey, how are you doing? Anything I can help with? What are you promoting these days? You got a webinar coming up? What do you need? And keeping those relationships warm. You know, it's funny. Some of my clients sometimes say, you know, how will I know if I'm communicating too much? I said, well, if you're communicating value and you're asking, how can I help? What can I do? What do you need? I have never gotten angry at someone saying, you know, gosh darn that Cloris Kylie, she is too helpful, she is too useful, she is too relevant, I don't like her at all. 
I don't like her at all. She's checking in on me. She's making sure she promotes my next webinar. She makes sure that we're doing the podcast together. I love all of this, right? So it's, it's people say, well, how much is too much? If you're doing it appropriately, and it really is adding value. And again, it's not about link spamming. It's not about sending them nonsense that you're not thinking about. But if you do it strategically and you organize it like a sales campaign, your system absolutely works. It absolutely works. And I have found personally in, you know, I'm not an expert in this area. I'm a consumer of this. And that's why I enjoyed reading your book so much. And that's why, you know, we connected so well. But everything that you say in here is completely spot on. Now, one thing we didn't mention is you also have a done for you service. Is that correct? Right. Tell us how that that works. Well, um, I found that a lot of my clients needed to have the whole podcast guesting process handled for them. Just because they said, well, you know, I guess I could, I could hire somebody to do the research and then I have to, I don't know exactly you know, what, how to write the pitches and how to follow up with the podcasters. It does require time. So I said, okay, I'll do it for you. So what I do is I mentor you through the process. So you are a perfect guest. So uh, you actually lead people with your message to sign up for your email list and to sign up for a consultation, depending on the call to action. But I actually book the shows for you. So that's one service I offer. Then the other service is to help you create that foundation so that you send people who meet you through those podcast, YouTube uh, group appearances to that funnel. So basically uh, build that uh, funnel to grow your list via consultations funnel or just a regular opt-in funnel to take care of the technology. Because I think technology should never stop anyone from implementing this. Absolutely right. Well, I've got two final questions as we're wrapping up. My final, final question is going to be where can people get connected and stay connected to more Chloris Brilliance and websites and downloads and all kinds of cool things that we're going to link up under the episode here in the show notes when people go to the speakingshow.com directly under this episode is going to be all of Chloris's goodies. Before we get to that, though, if people were to take one central idea, from our conversation today about influencer marketing. What do you hope that central concept should be? The central concept is that this is possible for you and it is possible right now. And the best time to start is today. So just you know, don't delay it. Take action. It's about delivering value first. You'll see that success and that success will bring more success, but you have to get started. So the time is right now. Fantastic. Now, how do people get connected and stay connected to more Chloris Brilliance? We can send them to the book, the website, the goodies, the downloads. What do we have for people to link up down below? Yeah, thank you, David. Well, you will see a link at chloriskelly.com forward slash do it. You will see my guide with 15 ways to get noticed by influencers to grow your business. So this is a series of ideas that you can implement today just to connect with those influencers. And you'll see, like, as you're reading through the ideas, maybe more ideas will pop up for you to create and start those relationships. So that's at chloriscali.com slash do it. If you go to chloriscali.com, you will see then how to access my podcast, Beyond Influencer Marketing, just resources and articles about it, previous episodes. And I also invite you to connect with me on Facebook. I have a Facebook group called the Beyond Influencer Marketing Group. Uh, so just go to Facebook and uh, search for it and uh, we'll be there just talking about this topic and how to really make relationships a central part of your business so you thrive in the long term. Totally fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Cloris. This was fantastic talking with you. We have to have you back again. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe, tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time. 